We are going to be doing, we're learning a mimer today that was taught by the Lubavitch Rebbe in 1953. And what makes this mimer especially fascinating is the story and the history of the events surrounding this particular day in history. 1953, during Stalin's Russia, Stalin was a terrible tyrant who murdered um, 20 million of his own people and especially had a special hatred a particular hatred for the Jewish people. The Jewish people under Stalin's rule could be killed. Every person could be killed for nothing. Life was, Rahman al was unfortunately was, was nothing. Without any trial, without any obstruction, without, even, without justice or even room for um, expecting justice. People were killed for simply wanting to observe Shabbos, to observe a mitzvah, learn Torah. It was a terrible time. And then, came the doctor's plot. The doctor's plot was a conspiracy theory. It claimed that Jewish doctors were intentionally murdering Russian people and especially Russian children. Stalin's plan with this propaganda was to create, to generate and build up terrible animosity, real hatred towards the Jewish people. His plan, he wanted everybody to hate the Jewish people. He wanted them to hate them enough so that they would be, and then to make the Jewish people safe, um, he would have them relocated into deep into Siberia, far away, deep into the lands that were not conducive to actual life. They were, they were freezing, they were undeveloped territories where Khasrashalm, the people who, who would be sent there would basic, basically be left to to die, to perish, because it was impossible to sustain life in those undeveloped, freezing regions deep into Russia's Siberia. Stalin began the implementation of his plan, Yamach Shemai may his name be erased, is just a modern day Haman. Uh, and he got six, a, a, rec, a Haman of recent history at least, and he got six Jewish doctors to confess to their crimes. Obviously they never did anything of the sort, but they were tortured and under, under that torture, they, they, they said yes. And so word began to spread. Jewish doctors were fired from all their positions. Um, you couldn't get a job. The hatred was spreading fast and furiously. It was a terrible time. And then came Purim. Okay, that year, miles and miles away from Russia, at the Farbrangen in Crown Heights in 770. Purim Fabrangans were always very, very Lebedic, and at the same time, very the Rebbe became very, very serious. At about two o'clock in the morning, this was almost after people thought the Fabrangan was already over. The Rebbe became very serious, and he told the following story. He said that during the times of Rabbi Shalom Daivber, the Rebbe Rashab. That was the time when elections started to happen. That was the, when Tsarist Russia was over and, and, and officially there were elections for the communist government, okay? And this, so people were encouraged to go vote. Now this chassid, chassid of the Rebbe Rashab, or maybe the Rebbe Rashab told this story, I'm not sure if it was, I, I don't recall if it was a chassid of the Rebbe Rashab or the Rebbe Rashab told this story, a chassid went to vote, and it was a political rally where different people would be giving speeches, and he had no idea. He did not even understand Russian. He couldn't even speak the language, <laughs> but he put on his gartel. You know, he went to the mikvah before because the Rebbe instructed them to, to go vote. And so he's standing there, and after a person made a speech, he, he understood that you're supposed to cheer. And everybody around him was cheering, hur hurrah, hurrah. Now in English, we say, hooray, hooray. Apparently in Russian, they say, hurrah, hurrah. Now in Hebrew, the words hurrah means he is evil. He is bad. And so the Rebbe told this story and the Rebbe became very serious. And it was out of context of the rest of the Fabrengan. And the Rebbe said, hurrah. A 
and the Rebbe was saying it very, very seriously. And people joined in. The Hasidim joined in. And everybody was, was shouting three times, Hoorah! 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 He is evil! He is evil! He is evil. And then the Rebbe began to teach the mimer, which we are going to learn right now. And, and this is how it goes. Now, obviously, before we go into the actual mimer, one, one other thought, which, which, which many of you know, but, but for those of us who don't know this, Perm of that year was on March 1st. In 1953, Perm was on March 1st. On March 5th, it was announced that Stalin, Yemach Shemai Vizichrei, had died of a stroke suddenly in his sleep. And we know that this, his death actually happened a few days before March 5th, but it wasn't announced until March 5th. So it's very, very possible that he actually died either during that Fabrengen or immediately after that Fabrengen while everybody was saying, hoorah, he is evil. So let's learn the text. I have posted it on the chat. Um, and it'll also be ava available online. We're not going to learn the entire thing. We won't go through the text in a line by line way. Um, I actually realized today that we learned a little bit of this mimer last year, if anybody wants to listen to that recording. So you don't need the actual text in front of you, but if you can learn it inside on your own afterwards, it's, in, it's printed in the Sefer Hamaymarim Malukat Chelek He on page Kuf Pei Test. For those of you who are going to Get that safer. It's also on the chat um, and it will be online um, with the notes, like on the recording. Um, okay, so this, this is for the, um, okay, so I'm just going to translate straight. Okay, the Myra begins with the words, Al Kain, Karu, La Yamu Ma'ela, Purim, Al Shame, Apor. So there's a Pasuk in the Megillah that says, therefore, these days are called, these days, these days of Purim, the days of celebration, will be called by the name. Purim, which means lottery, named after Hapur, the lottery that Haman cast, that Haman threw to determine the date of the Jews' destruction. Now we know that the, the, the name of a holiday, the name of the Yom Tif, symbolizes and represents the essence of the miracle that happened. For example, Hanukkah is named after the rededication of the Beis HaMikdash. Pesach, is named after Pesach means to jump. Hashem jumped over the houses of the Jewish people to save them. Sukkot is named after the clouds of glory that protected the Jewish people in the desert. Every Yom Tif symbolizes the miracle, the goodness, Hashem's love, Hashem's embrace. And now Purim is the only exception. Purim is named apparently for the destruction, for the Gezerah, for the terrible decree to destroy the Jewish people. And the question is why? This was not, they had nothing to do with the miracle. It was the, it was the, it was the bad part of the, of the, of the holiday, of the Yom Tif. We want, why is the, the name, we're the happiest day of the year and we're calling it Purim, Al Shem Hapur, named after Hapur, that lottery, that gyral, that Haman threw, to decide when is a good time to murder every man, woman, and child, young and old, babies, infants, elderly, bubbies, zadies, everybody in one day. So what's, what's that all about? Now, obviously, so the first, the first connection that we want to, before we get into the name of Purim and what it represents, what the meaning of that is, Another thing that we notice about the name of Purim is that it's similar to Yom HaKippurim. In fact, Chazal tell us that Purim and Yom Kippur are very deeply connected. In fact, Yom HaKippurim is called Yom HaKippurim because it's like Purim. In a certain sense, Purim is even holier, more powerful, more spiritually strong, potent than Yom Kippur in a certain sense. And that's why Yom HaKippurim, it's only like Purim. It's like, you know, if, if you want to ever compliment your mother-in-law, you say, you say, this soup 
is almost as good. You, you compliment your wife. You say, this soup is almost as good as your mother makes it. I'm just kidding. That's not a good compliment, right? Because then you're saying it's not as good, right? It's like someone else's soup. It's like what we had in the restaurant. No, you don't want to say that. You want to say it's better than what you had in the restaurant, right? Yom Kippur is so holy. It's Kippurim. It's like Purim. That symbolizes that Purim has something even greater, more spiritually powerful, even than, uh, than Purim. And at the same time, they're very connected. There's two similarities that we find with Yom Kippur and Purim. And that is, number one, both of them, and, in, and they're really the same thing, but you, you see it in, in two different ways. Purim had a gyrol, right? It had a lottery. Haman threw a lottery to decide which month is a good month to fulfill his wicked plan. On, on Yom Kippur, we also have a lottery. Every, the highlight, the, 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 the peak of the part of the Aveda of Yom Kippur is there's a gyro. They, the Kayan Gadzal would take two si'irim, two goats, and there would, be, there would be a gyro between them. There would be a lottery between them. One of them would be taken to Azazel, and one of them would be brought up as a carbon in the Beis HaMikdash. So there was also that concept of a girl on Yom Kippur. Another similarity of Yom Kippur to Purim is that they're both spiritually on the level of a girl. And let's talk about what that means. What is a girl spiritually? What is the power of a lottery in spiritual terms? The best visual that I could think of for this is that uh, uh, we're going to say a few, okay? I'll say two different ones. Imagine you have a close relative, okay? A husband and wife or mother and daughter. Okay, now the person who's very close to you, either it's your daughter or it's a parent or it's a sister, does something that's very, very upsetting. You ask them to, they, uh, let, me, let me be very specific, okay? You ask your sister, you're going to be on Kingston Avenue, or you're gonna be on 13th Avenue while you're there and you're coming to my house anyways, could you pick up a bottle of milk? Because I really need a bottle of milk, okay? Five minutes later or 10 minutes later, she walks into your house and you say, where's the milk? And she doesn't have the milk. She forgot and you're upset. I just asked you for the bottle of milk. What happened? You, you forgot? You don't care about me? Even if you say, even if you don't say you don't care about me, you might feel like, hey, I'm not important enough. You were busy on your phone. You were distracted. But just a little bottle of milk, that's all I'm asking you for. And you couldn't remember it. It might feel, you might feel hurt. We might feel upset. We might, and, and it will get in between you and your sister or you and your daughter or you and your husband, whoever that person is that, that didn't do the thing that you asked them to do. Okay? You're upset. Five minutes later, that person trips over something in your house and really hurts themselves. They sprain their leg very badly. Suddenly you feel uh, 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 an overwhelming sense of care and love for this person. What happened to your resentment from five minutes ago? Five minutes ago, you were upset. They didn't bring the milk. But now while they're sprawled across the floor in agony, you feel love and you feel nothing but love and care. Right? Does, that, do, do, does that resonate with you? Thank you for people who have their cameras on so I can see. Okay, so you feel love. What happened? What happened? You realize in that moment that your love for this person and your connection with this person is bigger than the bottle of milk. The bottle of milk was important. The bottle of milk was nice. The bottle of milk would have been an expression of love, of kindness, of commitment, of, of, of caring about you. And yet your love for them is bigger than all of that. Your love for them is bigger than that bottle of milk, right? That triggered that sense of love. So we all have in our, we, we all have in our, in, in, in every relationship, there's a place where we have expectations where we have desires, where we have needs, where we have wants. And when those expectations, those are logical, they make sense. 
They're, everyone, everyone understands you. You, you could, you could expect this person to call you. You, you could expect th this person to care about you, and yet, and when they don't, you're upset. Rightfully, logically, it makes a lot of sense. And then there's a place in the relationship that is bigger and deeper and more profound than all of that. That means even when those things are violated, even when your expectations are not met, and even you have unmet needs and disappointments, there is a love and there's a connection that runs deeper. It's beyond logic. Ask me to explain. Why do I, a minute ago, I was, I was really angry at this person. Forget the bottle of milk. It was much worse than a bottle of milk. It was a bottle of milk 20 times. It was, it was a very big disappointment. Everyone has their own bottle of, bottles of milk in your own relationship. You know exactly what I mean when I'm talking about the unmet needs or the disappointments, right? And yet, there's a profound connection and there's a profound love that you cannot even explain in words. You love them because you love them, right? In our relationship with Hashem, that level of connection is called beyond Seder Hishtalshalos. Seder Hishtalshalos is the, the name, the, the description that the Zayhar gives for the way that Hashem's light and Hashem's energy is manifest in this world. And it's a logical, orderly progression, okay? And then the Zayar describes something that's called Lamaila Miseder Shtalshala, something that's above and beyond what makes sense, something that's above and beyond what's orderly, something that cannot be described in any ordinary words. Let me give you another example of what this looks like, okay? In our bodies, we have different parts of our bodies. Okay, we have our hands, we have our feet, we have our hair, we have our nose, we have our toes, different parts of our body. And then there's a part, what we will call the seminal drop of life, that essential self, where there's no difference between our head and our toes. It's just me. There's my head, there's my toes, there's my nose. Those, there's parts of us that's different. And then there's a part of us that's me that includes everything about me that's beyond differentiation and beyond, um, beyond differences because it's that place where everything is one and the same. To give another visual, just because I'll tell you why I'm doing so many different visuals because we're gonna, this is a very important concept. Another visual is that I could think of is let's say a tree, okay? A tree has many branches and leaves on those branches. And each one is its own unique thing, your own you. This branch might be a pretty healthy, strong branch and a different branch might be weak and cracked and about to fall off, okay? And yet there's a part of the tree on the trunk of the tree where it's just a tree. There's no differentiation. There's no different branches. There's no separation. There's no details. It's just a tree, that essential life force that is the essence of what the tree is. Okay, so spiritually speak, speaking, a gyro represents a level in Kedusha, a, a, a space, a, a space within Hashem's relationship with the world that is beyond Seder Hashem, that's beyond what comes down in differentiated expression. Now we relate to Hashem, usually the entry point to relationship with Hashem is doing a mitzvah. When we do a mitzvah, that's how we embrace Hashem and that's how, how Hashem embraces us, right? Because really, how could an infinite creator be connected with me? I'm a person, I have, I have limitations. How could Hashem be one with me and how could I be one with Hashem? Hashem is infinite and I am finite. Hashem is limitless and I am, limited, but Hashem chose to desire and to need us to do a mitzvah. And so when we do a mitzvah, we are one. We have that ability to touch the infinity, to be one with the infinite, to be enwrapped, to be embraced by Hashem himself from head to toe, to literally be one with Hashem. That's, that's a mitzvah. And so, and a mitzvah is very, very special. 
And yet amidst there's something in our relationship, just like in a relationship between two people, there's the things that keep us together, the things we do for each other, the love that flows between us. And then there's something that's deeper than all of that. There's that essential unbreakable bond. I love you because I love you. That's a gyro. So and let's talk about the connection between Yom Kippur and, and Purim. On Yom Kippur, we say, Lifnei Hashem, the Chazal tell us, or the Torah tells us, the power of Yom Kippur is Lifnei Hashem Titharu. You will become pure before Hashem. The Baal Tanya teaches us what's the, what's the meaning of the words Lifnei Hashem Titharu. Usually, Hashem relates to us in a way of Hashem. Yud Ke Vav Ke represents the way Hashem relates to us in a natural, orderly way of Seder Hishtal Shos, of that chain of Hashem's evolving light in the world. And the mitzvahs are, and that Seder Hishtal Shos depends on us doing a mitzvah. So on Yom Kippur, we stand, we access a part of our neshama that's deeper than Seder Hishtal Shalos. We access a part of our soul that is one with Hashem. We, 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 Mima Makim Kirasicha Hashem. We get to the depths of our soul, and from there we call out to Hashem, and we attain a state of Lifne Hashem Titaru. We get past the Shem Havaya. We wake up, we trigger the love, the bond, the connection, the unity that is bigger and deeper than the bottle of milk, bigger and deeper even than Torah and mitzvahs. That is the power of Yom Kippur. And that is also the power of Purim. Purim, the whole idea of Purim is, is Purim, it's a gyro. It's named after the power of a connection that transcends reason and logic. When do you make a gyro? When do, you throw, when, do, when do you have to throw the dice? When do you have to throw the dice? When you have two things that are exactly the same, that's when you need to make a girl. Because let's say I have, if you give a child a choice between an, a carrot and a, and, a, and a lollipop, what's the child gonna choose? The lollipop, right? Is that a choice? It's not even a choice, right? It's a compulsion. They will for sure choose the lollipop because they like the lollipop better because it tastes better. In our own lives, when we have a choice between one thing that's logically better and another thing that logically is not as good, the fact that we choose what's logically better, it's not really a choice. We're compelled to make that decision based on our logic. So Gairo represents I'm going to read these words. It's a revelation of Hashem's light, the infinite light that is above and beyond all reasons, all logic, all compulsions. It's Hashem wants us. It's a, it's a revelation of Hashem's light where Hashem wants us and loves us simply because we are His. Simply because we are His and He is ours. We belong to Hashem and Hashem belongs to us, not for any, any other reason. Okay, now the question is, now we have a big question. If, if a gyro is such a powerful level of, if, if, the, if the lottery, the concept of a lottery is so special and so powerful and so spiritually strong, why on earth would Haman throw a gyro? Why would he use a lottery to try to even attempt to even try to destroy us? Why would Haman use something that's so powerful to try to destroy us? We just said that the concept of lottery in spiritual terms means a revelation of Hashem's light that transcends reason and rhyme and logic. That's what a gyro is spiritually. A gyro is, a lottery is Hashem's great revelation of light. Then why would Haman use that? Haman was a smart person. He was very evil, 
but he was brilliant and he was spiritually intelligent. He knew spirituality. He was extremely, uh, uh, he, was, he, was, he was trying to use spirituality to twist it and to inject his poison into something. But what, how, how could he make such a big mistake? And the reason is because Haman knew that when it comes to Seder Hishtalshalas, when it comes to reason and logic, every Jew is precious to Hashem. Why? Because we have mitzvahs. We have the Torah. Every Jew, even without trying, keeps at least some of the mitzvahs. Malayan mitzvahs kariman, right? Every Jew is full of mitzvahs like a, like a pomegranate is full, is full of seeds. Haman knew that on the level of mitzvahs, he is never going to win. Hashem will always choose the Jewish people over a Malik because Hashem loves us and Hashem will protect us and Hashem will never let anyone destroy us. So Haman said, look, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to reach into the very bottom of that cookie jar. I don't know if that doesn't really make sense. I'm going to reach into the core, to the roots of the tree, to the seminal drop of oneness, to that place in godliness where there is no difference between light and darkness, where there's no difference between Arar Haman and Baruch Mardachai. Over there, to Hashem, it's all one. Right? Esau and Yaakov were brothers. When they were born, when they grew up, Yaakov sat and learned Torah while Esau hunted animals in the fields. But at their very core, before, at the, at the, when they were conceived, that moment of conception in time, right? They were one, right? That's what twins are. Twins are one drop that doubles. It's one, it's one that becomes two. They were one. There was no difference in that core essence of their identity they were one that became two and in that oneness there's no difference between Yaakov and Esau because there is no separation between Yaakov and Esau so maybe in that oneness maybe I could accomplish says Haman maybe Haman thought that in that space of oneness of Hashem by the way we're talking about the oneness in time you see to us what do you mean Esau and Yaakov were already born. How could you go to the oneness? But in, Hash, in, in spiritual terms, we're not talking about in time. We're talking about in energy, in, in, in space, in levels of, of transparency of, of Hashem's light as it descends in the world, right? So Haman thought that at this level of oneness at the core where Yaakov and Esau are brothers and they're one and there's no difference between them in that space he is going to inject his poison and he will win over the Jewish people okay now we could understand by the way I'm skipping a, a, a few ICIs I'm skipping Vav, Zion and Ches Let's talk about something that's not actually in the text, but we need to understand this in order to appreciate what comes next in the, in the text, okay? When the story of Purim happened, the Jewish people experienced a tremendous challenge. It was a very challenging time in history. They had been exiled. They were sent in Gullus after the destruction, after the Chorban of the first Beis HaMikdash. And throughout their time in Gullus, throughout their time in exile, they knew through the Nevi'im and a promise through the prophets, that they would be returning home to Eretz Yisrael in 70 years. They had that promise. After 70 years, they would be going back, they would be redeemed from their exile, and they would be returned to Eretz Yisrael and, and rebuild the base of English. Now, the 70 years came and went without the promise being fulfilled. As it turned out, they counted incorrectly. The 70 years had not actually passed, but they thought the 70 years passed. In fact, that's really what Ahasuerus was celebrating in his grand party because Ahasuerus also knew 
that the Jewish people would be freed from his kingship after 70 years. And at that time, when the Jewish people would be redeemed, that would signal the waning of his glorious empire. It would be the beginning of his end. And so Ahasuerus did not want those 70 years to arrive. And when his counting of the 70 years passed, he wanted to celebrate the fact that now he was sure, he was certain that his kingdom would last forever. The Jewish people would never be redeemed. They would forever be stuck under his kingship and his kingship would last forever. So it was a very difficult time for the Jewish people. It was a time of Hester. It was a time of Achash, Veirash, Chash, meaning silent. It was as if there was a silence. There was a tremendous silence that, that, that of, 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 the, of Hashem's presence in the world, a very tremendous concealment. We know that Esther, it's called Megillas Esther. Megillah means reveal. Esther means hiddenness, right? We want to reveal the hiddenness. But that time of history was tremendous concealment. It was, a, it was, a, it was from the birth of the Jewish people as we were taken out of slavery in Mitzrayim, in Egypt, until that time, there was always a steady stream of revealed miracles. And even when there weren't miracles, there was a revealed presence of Hashem. And here in Persia was the first time there was nothing. It was silent. There were no signs of Hashem's love. There were no signs of Hashem's active involvement in their lives. They could not see it. And that's really what led us as a people to sin at the Feast of Ahasuerus. We got distracted in Golis. We lost sight of Hashem's power and of Hashem's presence in our lives. We lost sight of our connection. We forgot about who we are. We forgot about our true value. We forgot about what makes us who we are. We forgot about our essential Yiddishkeit. We thought we're just second-class citizens in the Persian society, in the P P Persian culture. And so Ahasuerus' invitation and treated with so much dignity made us feel good. We felt good. We felt like now we're finally arrived. Now we finally made it in society. We are respected. We are valued. We belong. And that was the sin. That is what brought on the decree of our destruction, not as a punishment, but when we attribute power to Ahasuerus, we're controlled by Ahasuerus. Like any time you give power to a person, we are controlled by the people we give power to. That's just the nature of how it works, right? So when we attribute real power to any person, we're controlled by that person. And Ahasuerus hated us. So being controlled by Ahasuerus meant being wiped out completely. We left Hashem. Now we're under control of Ahasuerus. He hates us. We're doomed. That's what Ahasuerus wanted. Now Haman, of course, wanted it too, but it was all from Ahasuerus. At the time of the decree, there was one way to save, if a Jewish person wanted to save their life, there was one way that they could do it. Ahas dasai. They could, they could renounce their religion. They could decide, they could say, I am no longer part of the Jewish people. If they stopped being Jewish, they did not have to die. They could save their lives. All they had to do was say, I'm out of here. I'm out of this. I'm done. I'm finished. I don't need this. I don't want it. I want to live. I don't want to die. And with that, according to the laws of nature, they would be guaranteed to live. Their safety would be guaranteed. Their lives would be spared. The decree would be over for them. It would not include them. And in the entire year, while this decree was in place, not one Jewish person took that path. Not one. That's what we're talking about over here. The gyrol, that lottery came into place because logically speaking, at that point in history, with the great concealment of Hashem, and I, I personally, this is my own uh, thought, but I say this today, you know, some people wonder, you know, why? Why are so many of our teenagers, you know, going astray? Why are so many of our people, you know, you know, becoming light and light in their observance? I think that every person who keeps Shabbos is a miracle. The fact that we are here 
learning about Purim, eager to inspire and elevate our experience, our spiritual experience of connection, of joy with Hashem. We're a miracle. We are a miracle. And that miracle has a name. It's called Purim. It's called Gairo. Because Gairo is a level in Ruchnius, a level in spirituality that transcends reason and logic. We chose Hashem on a level of Bechira, which is even higher than Gairo. But let's just use the word Gairo here, okay? We chose Hashem. We chose Hashem not because of Hashem's miracles, because there were no miracles at the time. We chose Hashem not because we were afraid of being punished by Hashem, because the fear was from the real threat of being killed. That was a real fear. We chose Hashem simply because we belong to Hashem and Hashem belongs to us. We chose Hashem because in the depths of our souls, this is what we want. We want to be hidden. We want to feel connected to Hashem because we are connected to Hashem. This is our life. This is who we are. This is our identity. This is what we always wanted. In the depths of our souls, at the core of our being, we want Hashem more then we want physical pleasures, more than we want comfort, more than even our safety. We want our physical safety because to be one with Hashem is true life. We want Hashem more than we want anything else. We care about pleasing Hashem more than we care about pleasing Ahasuerus or any other person. I want to just share uh, a couple of days ago was, was, was the yard site of my grandmother, Bunya Shvei. Um, and be a good to better for all of us. My father told a story of his early childhood at the time when they were, um, when we, they were, it was during World War II. And he remembers an argument that his parents had while they thought the children were sleeping. Or maybe it was an argument that extended into the days while the children were awake in front of him. At the time, every family had to deliver one member of the family to the front lines to support the war effort and dig trenches on the outskirts of the city. There was a very big chance that the person who was sent would not return home alive. The Nazis in Machshimam were, were pounding those areas with bombs day and night. And yet somebody had to go. And so his Parents were arguing. In most homes, the father went. But my father had two brothers, and his mother argued that she wanted to go. Her husband shouldn't go. She should go. And her winning argument was, I will go because if one of us doesn't come home, we need you because you're the only one who could teach Tyra. You're the one who could teach our boys Tyra. Now, if you think about it, it doesn't even make any bit of sense, right? Isn't comfort more important? Isn't safety more important? Isn't it more likely for a man to survive rather than a woman with his strength? And by the way, Baruch Hashem, um, uh, you know, they had to go for a certain amount of time, maybe it was a week or two. And um, the day that she came back, they left on the very last train that was leaving the city. My father says he remembers looking out of the train window as it pulled out. Um, and, and out as it left the city, he remembers looking out of the window and seeing the city go up in flames. So literally their lives were saved and, 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 and her life, she put in danger. Why? For Tyra, that her children should have Tyra. What, was she stupid? <laughs> she was not stupid. For her and for the Jewish core, and this is what we all have inside of us, right? We want life. Life is connection with Hashem. We want a connection with Tyra, a connection with Hashem more than we want physical life because that's our true life. And that's what the Jewish people chose. That, that was what was triggered within them during that entire year. When Haman said, you have, you, when the decree was, when society said, renounce your Judaism or die, every single Jew said, no way will I renounce my Judaism. From that, from that place of despair and determination, we chose Hashem and Hashem chose us from the core of Hashem's truth. 
And that is what directly led Hashem to choose us. To choose us. That is the definition of tshuva. That is lefnei Hashem titaru. Throughout the year, you know, when I'm in a moment of, 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 of choice, I might choose my comfort over davening. I might choose to browse the internet rather than say a capital of Tehillim, right? But when push comes to shove, at the core of my being, I want that connection more than I want anything else. I want the oneness of Hashem, and we all do. We want a relationship with Hashem more than we want anything else, more than we want things that disconnect us, that get in our way, that obstruct our ability to experience Hashem's presence. We want connection, we want oneness, we want to feel his embrace, we want to be in his presence more than we want anything else. And that's tshuva, that's lupnei Hashem titaru that we do on Yom Kippur, and that is what we did on Purim. And as we did that, we triggered that tremendous flow of our Ein Saif, that light, that infinite light of Hashem that is beyond reason and logic. And every year on Purim, this is the spiritual energy of Purim. What happens on Purim? Every year on Purim, I'm going to read the, 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 the words inside, towards the end of the Mimer. Rezeho Indian Purim. This is the idea of Purim and the name Purim. And by the way, that's specifically why the name was called Purim, Al Shem Hapur, because that is what caused the greatest miracle. Haman wanted our destruction, and that's why he made a gyro. But that very gyro, he un by by with that very gyro, he unleashed a whole new, deeper, more profound level of connection between Hashem and the Jewish people. And every year on Purim, though we do not thankfully have that tremendous danger, and we do not have the decree that's threatening our lives or our existence, Baruch Hashem. At the same time, every year on Purim, that tremendous energy of Purim, of, of Hashem's light that's beyond definition, beyond description, beyond words, beyond any orderly descent, beyond what we deserve, beyond even Tyra and Mitzvah itself, that infinite light is unleashed in the world every single year. Hashem chooses us again and again and again, because of that time that we chose him. Um, one, other, one other little piece that I missed out here is that that's one, we know one interesting detail is that Haman specifically built a eight, a tree, 50 amas high, 50 cubits high. Why specifically the number 50? Because there's 49 levels of Bina, 49 Sha'are Bina. And Moshe got all of them. There's 50 levels of Bina. Moshe got all of them except for the last one, right? Nun Bai, he was buried on Har Nevai. Nun Bai, because in his passing, he got that 50th. Nun is 50 and Bai is he, he, in him, right? So in his passing, he got that 50th. But throughout his lifetime, he had only the 49th. He had only 49. Haman wanted to touch that level of Ruchnius, that level of spiritual energy, that essence of godliness, the deep core of Hashem's light. I know what the visual is. You know when you have an angle? You know when there's an angle at the ends of the, and you could make an angle, like the lines could go very different and very, they could be very different, but at the core, they're one, right? So Haman knew that at this side of the angle, over here and over here, the Jewish people are very different. They have the merit of Torah and mitzvahs. Even if they don't want to, even if, even if they sin, they still have the merits of Torah and mitzvahs, right? But he wanted to get to the core of Hashem's light. And over there, there's no merits because there's no faults. There's no description. There's no definition. There's no desire. It's just Hashem's infinite light. And, and, and by doing that, he unleashed that very light into the world that year and every year on Purim. And we call it Purim because not, not obviously not for the Gezerah, but for the unleashing of that infinite light that is beyond reason, beyond logic, and beyond any measurements. Okay, now one, one beautiful other thought that I just want to add in here. Purim is a time, right? 
when when there's a tremendous spiritual energy drawn down into the world. Okay, what is the kayak? What is this gift? What is this energy? What is the power of this day? The power of the Purim is that even in that space beyond logic and beyond reason, even in that space where we do not theoretically deserve, where it makes no sense to love us, Hashem, Hashem loves us. That's where Hashem chooses us. That's where Hashem embraces us as his people. Hashem chooses us. And Hashem erases a Malik, even at the core. Even beyond reason, even when we're not doing mitzvahs, even when we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. And Hashem erases all the negativity, all the doubts, and all the force that tries to pull us down and out. And so here's what I was thinking. There is a massive miracle coming our way. That miracle is called Geula. Okay? Purim is that day of miracles, and the miracles are coming our way whether or not we do anything about it. And yet, Let's notice one detail in the mimer and in the story of Purim in general, okay? And for this, I, I hope it's okay. I'm going to take a little diversion here for a second, okay? The Gemara has a question, and this, the Lubavitch Rebbe shared this thought in a Fabrengen of Purim Tafshin Chafhei. That's Purim 1965, okay? He says, the Gemara has a question about where we should start reading the Megillah on Purim. There are different opinions. One opinion says we should start reading the Megillah when the miracles began. Okay. Another opinion says we should start reading when Haman rose to power because that's the Gezerah. That's when the Gezerah began. Another opinion says we should start reading from the point when Mordechai enters the scene. When we learn about Mordechai Hatzadik's Yichus, Ish Yehudi Hoya B'Shushan Abir, and there was a Jewish man, his name was Mordechai, right? Ben, ben Shimi, Ben Kish, Ish Yemini, over there. And Rabbi Meir says, Rabbi Meir says, start reading from Vayihi Bimei Achashverosh. And it was in the days of Achashverosh. All the way from the beginning, from the history, from many, many years, decades before the decree against the Jewish people and the whole entire story of Purim. And the question is, why? Throughout the Gemara, whenever Rabbi Meir has an opinion that's different from Rabbi Yaisi, the halacha, the ruling, follows Rabbi Yaisi and not Rabbi Meir. And it's the same with the others. Whenever there's a difference of opinion, we do not usually follow Rabbi Meir's opinion in halacha. Here is an exception. Here we do. Why was it established this way? And the answer is because that is the story of that is the miracle. It looks like it's just a story. It looks like it's totally unrelated, separate from our story. It's just a random story in the history of the world about a king, Achashverosh, and his wife, Vashti, and she died, and she did this, and they had a party, and there's, there was this at the party and that at the party. But it wasn't a random story. Because long, long before there was any hint of connection to the Jewish people, long before there was a story, there was already a story. And what was it a story about? It was a story of Hashem setting the stage to save us. Even before the story of Purim started, there was a story. There was a, a miracle. It was a story. It was always a story about Hashem choosing us. Every detail set into place, even from Vayihibi Me'achashverosh, from the very beginning of the Megillah, where the other, the, the voices in the Gemara say, no, that has nothing to do with the story of Purim, leave it out. But ultimately, they all agree that yes, it has nothing, it has nothing outright to do with the story of Purim, but that's where Hashem was setting the stage. Every detail was set into place so that there could be this massive miracle, this massive unleashing of Hashem's light into this world. It was all from Hashem. It was all about the Geula. It was all about this massive miracle from the, begin from the very beginning, long, long before it was obvious. And first of all, this is a lesson in our personal lives. When we tell the story of our own lives, this is my own thought, okay? Um, I just want to differentiate because this is officially text-based learning. 
When we tell the stories of our own lives, we might think that our current reality is entirely different from the past. Where I am now has nothing to do where I was yesterday or the day before. And maybe we even feel like whatever happened in the past is separate from what's happening now. I'm glad it's over, or I'm sorry it's over, but it's not today, it's not. It's not that way. Every single detail of our life, from the minute we were born and even before we were born, every minute of our life was leading up to wherever we are right here and right now. Whatever we experienced, whatever success and failures we had, it was all a necessary part of our story. The happy times, the difficult times, the sad times, the joyful times, the times of love, the times of pain, the times of hope and despair and victory and failure, whatever we experienced was necessary. There was nothing random. There was nothing unrelated to our story. Nothing was for nothing. Even when it looked boring or difficult, even when it looked like nothing special, every moment, every experience in our lives is planned from Hashem and it's a necessary part of what Hashem needs from us. It's all part of our story. Every moment of our past gives us the strength that we need for this moment in history, for this part of our story. And that's on a personal level, okay? And on a global level, as a community, when we look around the world, the things that we hear about are not so happy these days, right? They're not happy. It may seem like we're very far from Geula Chas Vashon, and we do not understand a thing there's so much pain, there's so much confusion. If we try to make sense of the world events, we could literally become dizzy. It's impossible, impossible to understand. But one thing we know for sure, and this is the lesson of the Megillah, this is not my own words. This is the lesson that the Rebbe says in Purim Tavshin Chafei, that the Lubavitch Rebbe says, Purim Tavshin Chafei. The fact that the Megillah, we read the Megillah and it's a mitzvah to read the Megillah from the words by Yehibi Me'ach Hashverish from the details that had nothing to do with the story as we know it, the decree and the miracle, right? It had nothing to do with the miracle, certainly had nothing to do with the decree, right? We, we, we start from there, why? Because that's what we know for sure, that just like in the story of the Megillah, every single moment was leading towards Vinahapahu. It was leading towards the miracle. And so it is today as well. We know that this moment in history, though it may seem unrelated, though it may seem unconnected, though it may seem random, confusing, like what does it have to do with anything good? It is leading directly towards the Ula. Everything that Hashem is doing, everything that's happening in the world, it's only by Hashem, for Hashem's people, for us, for the Ula. It's all part of the process. And of course, we dive in Pada Bishal and Nafshi, Right? We want it to be b'shalom. We want the redemption, the geula to be peacefully and easy. So we dive in for an easy, smoother, lichtiger process, a, a, more, a more beautiful, simpler, smooth process. No, no more blood should be shed. No more tears should spill. No more pain, right? And, and at the same time, this is part of the process. How do we know? Because that's what it, that's what it always is. Even in the Megillah, it was. It's all happening with or without us, but there's never been a more important time to get involved because we are at the thick of it. We are at that point where Mordechai told Esther, this is your moment, okay? You clearly see a fire raging. You clearly see a gezerah. This is not a good, this is, this, 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 we're very precarious. It's a very fragile moment in history, right? And Mordechai tells Esther, this is your time. This is your opportunity to make all the difference, to make to step up and risk your comfort, risk your very life. Baruch Hashem, I don't think we, we're talking about that today. We're not talking about risking our life. We're talking about risking our comfort, right? And Mordechai tells Esther, if you do not do it, don't worry. The miracles will still happen. Mashiach will still come. The Geula will still come about. And it's the same today. This is our moment in history, okay? This is our opportunity to make all the difference. It's, it's, it's up to us, right? Mashiach will come regardless, but this is our time to do something so that we can be part of it, to take something on, to learn more Torah, to invest effort 
to be conscious of Hashem's presence, to let Hashem make a difference to our day, to the way we interact with our children, to our family members, to the way we shop, we cook, we clean, we dance, everything. This is our time to raise our consciousness. And if we let, to raise our consciousness of Hashem and let his presence make a difference to all of these activities every day. And in a way, it makes no sense. In many ways, it makes no sense. So many people are in so much pain. And I don't want anyone here to feel like, okay, now we have another thing to do. That's not, that's not what this is about. If we could let Hashem's presence and our awareness of Hashem's presence make a difference, make you feel not so lonely and not sad and uplift your spirits, that is Mesiris Nefesh. That is the gyro. That is triggering the gyro, the Purim, the energy of Purim in, in our lives. Because that's what it was back then. They chose Hashem even when it didn't make any sense. And every one of us chose Hashem. That's, that's the Avaidah of Purim. Our work, our mission, our part in making the miracle happen is to choose Hashem. Hashem chooses us on Purim. That's what happens. Hashem chooses us. But it's up to us to choose Him back. 